Call of Duty Black Ops 2, one of the praise games to its single player and multiplayer, and yet its Metacritic is the opposite. Oddly enough, it's one of the games that is my first Call of Duty. I appreciate its story and its multiplayer, whether you're fighting on the Solar Club or fighting on Carrier. It's something that is memorable. I personally played Black Ops 2 as a kid, which isn't surprising, since most of us do, and back then, Call of Duty and Halo was wild to its trash talks. I feel like I'm a fucking gorilla with a fucking baseball bat fighting a retard with a spoon. Anyways, it has been 9 years, and I always think about Black Ops 2 and want to talk about it. Since it has been really long, and it's a game that I have been playing for 1000 hours on my PC or Xbox. World at War and Black Ops 1 was a success due to its campaign, multiplayer, and zombies. While Infinity War had some controversies because of putting Call of Duty every year with Modern Warfare 3 in its lawsuit, it still was a success and Treyarch was planning to make a sequel to Black Ops 1. But it changed the views of many and people expect Call of Duty Black Ops 2 is gonna play like Black Ops 1 or a recycled game but Treyarch changed their expectations, and it's the last COD that Treyarch put tons of effort into time, budget, and resources. Treyarch decided to do a near futuristic that is in 2025. They want the story to be better than Black Ops 1, so they decided to make players able to do customization to its guns, perks, and have optional missions open-ended levels, and able to make choices. It's fascinating to hear that players are able to make choices, because in an FPS genre, it's really rare to see that coming from a Call of Duty game that release every year. They also want to make the story to be that immersive, such as freedom from the players without going restriction, while having that linear Call of Duty and detail to the lighting. And those who are story fans from Black Ops 1, they want to make the story better. So they decided to add facial expressions, the horses also, which they will get paid by the way. Every choice have an impact to your journey, whether you shoot at the head or the leg. It's your choice as a player. On the multiplayer, Black Ops and World at War made them improve and explore more, such as adding a pick 10 system, more maps that will be memorable to people. And since this is a semi-futuristic game, they made killstreaks feel more of a semi-futuristic type game. And adding few killstreaks like Guardian, ASDs, Quads, you get the picture. And add more party modes for fun goofy stuff like gun game, one in a chamber, and etc. They want the multiplayer to have a lot of content for players to play since they think the multiplayer community and at the same time understanding the Call of Duty formula that is great for competitive or casual. And one last note to zombies. They didn't expect how the mode made a community like Black Ops or World at War. It's really great for people who wants to relax. And zombies is gonna be more bigger, like Todd Howard said. It allows us to have 16 times the detail. Like an open world map. They want to make a zombies different, but at the same time, the core gameplay is still there. Treyarch wants to make a big hit and take every risk just to make a complete package and can be played for everyone. The greatest hit of Black Ops 2 they want that says everything, freedom, and player expression. Call of Duty games have been more of a complex scripted sequence, enemies that stop and pop shooting, and level design, where you always go in one direction. Modern Warfare 3, while a game that I love due to its pacing, scripted moments, and intensity, is there, but it shares from Modern Warfare 1 and 2 and doesn't improve or downgrade except from turret sections and locations. Black Ops 2 has some of these but what's different if it's optional or not, which it really shows how Treyarch wants to make the players free 
and able to experience it in different ways if not most of the levels to its optional objectives where you can go or optional access and it's really striking because it also has that same chaotic script triggers too and actually there are some optional script triggers and has pacing and I also can't believe this but it also shares from more that wars intro at first it doesn't have a tutorial sequence and rather shows you the person is getting burned alive and brings an army of tanks, gunners, and foot soldiers, which also shares from what that war's intro, American Snack, and cause explosions and chaoticness. Fighting the MPLA is different from the PMC because of its technology in 2025 and its little details and locations. In Celerium, you can able to go stealth for a bit by not shooting except being quiet, then start the firefight by going to the stairs or use the elevator which is also evident on how the time and dedication is here. You're not restricted to go on a one path, but rather able to use its locations to flank or able to use different tactics, where you exploit the enemy's gap by going to an alternative route. And there are varieties in David's mission, where you have ASDs, quads, claws, hooking enemies, and auto turrets, which are really effective and sometimes can be threatening at times. If you encounter an ASD, you need to flank around or use an EMP grenade. Since the ASD's front is really strong, if you throw a grenade, they'll just deflect it. Quads are like the annoying buggers from drones in Halo 2, and I cannot believe I did another Halo reference. And claws are my favorite because it forces the player to use the light sandbox really well. And the enemy type is so perfect that it only has the one flaw, use a grenade launcher. RPG takes like 3-5 to five shots, and a noob tube takes one shot. They talk about my one -tops. Yeah, as tanky and bulky they are, its weakness is using a grenade launcher. It's really fantastic that the enemy types has a tense to it and can be scary at times and die so undeservingly. And while BO2 has these types, their hilarious bugstar is so funny that it's quite unintended. Actually, not because it's unrealistic, it's because how breakable it is. Oh, uh, what? The How did they disappear? What? And Alex missions have intensity to it due to its huge numbers and vehicles. While it also shares from other Call of Duty games, it doesn't from its narrative. You're not a super soldier, but rather a one man in a large firefight. You're not destroying a tank because you're Doom. You use the weapon you brought into just to change the tide from the Russians, while the Mujaveen helps you by destroying it. And it has the memorable firefight since you can go anywhere and able to destroy helicopters freely and doesn't make them invincible. While I died in old wounds so many times due to my idiosity from setting it harden and act like Rambo, you can get stomped if you're careless enough. Which brings me to difficulty. Call of Duty's difficulty isn't taken seriously because you can set it on normal and became a stop and pop shooting. While Call of Duty Black Ops 2 has intensity on harden, it's rather the false tension, or doesn't make you hype for it. Because while customization on paper is really neat, using weapons you're curious and able to add attachments to your expression, and able to carry two primary weapons on loadouts, three perks, and access points, it rather becomes easy and doesn't make the player excited. Remember when I said noob tubes are able to one-tap a claw? Well, you can just add that and use it by destroying ASDs and claws quickly and becomes easy. There are axes that can be used and able to change the tension into false tension. Example in old wounds, you can use mortar rounds or a nade launcher to destroy a BTR so easily instead of going up to get that weapon from the armory. And in fact, that's my main issue to Black Ops 2's gameplay. It doesn't share from Modern Warfare 3 hard and difficulty, tension, and is able to go on cover, use flashbangs often, make a decisive push, or picking enemies one by one slowly but surely. Black Ops 2 you can able to speedrun this because you have the easy tools to destroy the enemies. In Celerium, it takes like a minute for me to get into the next firefight in Harden. It's not all bad though because while I may criticize the customization, access, and its perks, it is optional in the end of the day. But if you're playing on a Harden or Veteran, it becomes a must due to its intensity being too much. But you can still die if you run carelessly or like an idiot because an enemy can simply take you down if you're not careful. Harden is a must if you want to have that decent intensity 
which normal doesn't. And while it's quite easy to run this, you can still have consequences by playing carelessly, which normal doesn't achieve. And what about Strike Force? On Harden, it's one of the most tense FPS RTS games I ever played, since you cannot use customization to its loadouts, perks, attachments, and primary guns are limited to your arsenal. Your allies are limited to 8 soldiers, and you need to use the sandbox effectively. You have to keep track of the spawning, locations, and the radar often. Using troops to position themselves, or wait for reinforcements to prepare for an attack, Club Spectre, and Dispatch are my favorites due to its tense and consequences. It's really barely manageable, and that's what I like. You always need to play smart and use the troops effectively to change the tide by defending or attacking. If you complete all the optional missions, it can actually change its gameplay to Judgment Day and dialogue to its story and summaries. More on that later. What makes it hard is if you have a soldier that dies or a turret that is destroyed, it is your own fault since they cannot cover the flank of yours and you need to rethink where to go. And that's what I love about these Strike Force. While there are people who hate it because to its game being hard and the controller being hard to use, I disagree. I experienced it on PC and Xbox and it's not hard to control, but rather you have to get used to it to its RTS mechanics by switching soldiers often and use every advantage you have. There is two issues with the Strike Force though, and I have to agree on this one. You can try to cheese the spawning, which is the first issue, and second, when you didn't save Karma, there is another strike force, that is second chance. When you rescue Karma and dies, you have to repeat it, and it makes it bullshit since your allies cannot kill a lot of soldiers, unless it's an ASD or a claw. If you can complete these missions without cheating the strike force, that's accomplished to you. And in fact, this is the first time Call of Duty did something unique that pushed the boundaries from the FPS genre. And it's the first time that Treyarch did different to its campaign's gameplay. While it doesn't represent Black Ops 2's campaign, what it does completes it. And speaking about the gameplay, we have to talk about the story. So I'm gonna split the story into two chapters. One is for David, and one is for Alex. I'm gonna tackle Alex first because he's the deepest in the start of everything. Black Ops 2 was one of the games that started to make me appreciate its stories, from games such as Metro Last Light, Far Cry 3, Halo 2. And while I love it, I have to admit, Black Ops 2 introduction is gotta be the campaign's highlight, setting the mood to characters such as Woods being old, Alex, Hudson, and new characters such as Menendez, Alex's son aka Section, and Harper. This introduction would be perfect if there's two issues I had. One is the weird dialogue. Go back to the army. Like you did when mom died. Dad, you said you'd never go back to the army. You promised me. And second is Harper revealing the villain immediately instead of trying to keep the villain a mystery and make David having a memory loss about him being tortured. In fact, that ruins the first scene of the game about Savimbi trying to make Menendez a mystery. Anyways, after the introduction, Woods tries to tell David and Harper about the story of his experience with Alex. And it's awesome for old players to see Alex, Mason, and Hudson by the way. Hudson and the Colonel wants to bring Mason back to the CIA because of his best friend getting captured, Woods. Alex mostly thinks that Woods is dead but wants to give a shot to save him. And it's the reason why he exists in the MPLA war. And while everything is simple to this narrative, it goes deeper to a darker hole. Savimbi tells you that Woods is in the cargo run, and after you found Woods, the Russian helicopter tries to kill you until you found the Valkyrie launcher and found the island that is an enemy territory where you try to hide. One thing that is my favorite and something subtle is while Mason is trying to put Menendez as hostage, you can hear Menendez talking about Ruhamen, one of the characters in Old Wounds, at the radio, making the scene when he betrays you more sense. In fact, Alex's missions are rather subtle because it can explain everything about Old Wounds. The reason why Hudson tries to contact the side antagonist is because when he tried to interrogate one of the Black Ops 1 villain, aka Kravchenko, he reveals that Menendez also has men for the CIA which can be shown when you try to get the CIA memo in Time and Fate. And one fan service that old players remember, Eggman included, is seeing Reznov and making an illusion, which is explainable in Black Ops 1. Even if you're talking to old Frank Woods himself, he reveals some highlights of Black Ops 1, 
and it's quite happy memory I had after I finished playing Black Ops 1. And one thing that started to make us empathize with the villain himself in Time and Fate is losing his sister because of Woods blowing her up. And Woods can't take his shit because he needs to get his anger out of the way by seeing Menendez because of his torture at the carrier ship. Which actually explains why when he encounters him, he still tries to fight back even though he got shot at the leg in Suffer With Me. Or when he founds him, instead of capturing, he tries to shoot him down. Menendez on the other hand, the reason why he takes revenge on the US and China is explainable in this opening scene. When you boot up your PC, it reveals that when he was a kid, he had a lot of issues, like his sister getting burns and injuries, his cartel being destroyed, and father getting killed. The cherry on top is also Wood's grenade. What makes it interesting is also how Menendez is also smart. Because when you know that he has the people in the CIA and his memo, it reveals that Menendez is forcing Hudson to manipulate Woods, killing his best friend Alex Mason. Which is the reason why David forgives his uncle, Frank Woods, because of Menendez's manipulation. Which is the reason why David wants to have that interrogation and wants to stop his schemes. This is why I love this story, because Woods to this very day is still guilty about it and feels sorry. He still is that badass character we know from Black Ops 1. But there's something behind him that still feels some guilt. Such as revealing to David that he is the responsible to kill his father, Alex Mason. That's why in the past, Woods has been protecting David when David has been alone in a child. Even if he cannot walk, like he used to. A veteran soldier that is retired from war just to redeem himself after killing Alex. There's some unrealistic explanations such as Menendez still being alive even though Wood's grenade impact them both by going to the room swiftly and David being captured. But the David explanation makes sense, but it's rather not shown except David's flashbacks at his head getting tortured by Menendez and Woods think that he got Menendez, but that's rather her sister in theory. Rather than Menendez, Menendez was alive but hiding somewhere. And before I go to David's story, I rather want to go to the characters. Alex and Woods has been one of the Black Ops iconic characters, featuring its charisma and personality. This is actually by far James C. Burns' greatest performance, and it really bumps me not featuring him in Cold War because of his lines making the scene more effective, and at the same time, having some funny lines. So while corporate America is kissing China's ass, Alex on the other hand is still that character that we know. But this time, he doesn't have some screw-ups in his head, getting brainwashed, and there's a reference for Black Ops 1. All that shit with the numbers. You really get brainwashed by the Soviets? And they gave it the best shot. But this time, he isn't the main character, but his son is. The next generation of Navy SEALs. And his development with Woods relate to the story because of Woods sharing the stories about him in Black Ops 1 and 2. Hudson on the other hand is rather a mixed bag. At first he's rather a side character, but after playing Black Ops 1 I was kinda disappointed for him not giving his major moments, except when he sacrificed himself just to save Woods and David. Also his voice actor was changed just to make the fans more disappointed. But I don't blame Treyarch because changing voice actors are a thing in games, such as Prophet of Truth. Miller from Last Light, so that's more of a personal reason rather than the game issue itself. Also I forgot the sound design. Most of its guns are alright and one of my favorite is the DSR since it has that punch. But my small complaint to the guns are the explosions. Whether you have a grenade, grenade launcher, or explosives, it sounds the same when it impacts, making it repetitive. But it all makes up to the score. Most scores I like are Halo, Half-Life 2, and Call of Duty World at War. But since Sin Moradian returned for Black Ops 2, they need a new composer. And that said composer is Jack Wall, the composer who was known for Mass Effect, who was assisted by Trent Reznor, who wrote the main theme. Jack Wall was already experienced in composing since he composed Mass Effect and other games. And one of my favorite tracks is hands down, High T and future wars.
Well, it wasn't memorable or one of the best soundtracks. Since every opinion to its soundtracks are subjective, each track suits the mix of the sound. That's the reason why I still play Solarium and Judgment Day still. But there is one problem. Most tracks are rather remixed from the others. Like High T, one of my favorites is rather a retread from Pakistan Run. And Future Wars is also a retread from Desert Ride. So while I love these soundtracks, they're rather remixes, which isn't bad, since they're not horrible. My problem is how when you hear the same thing again, it doesn't make you excited, like the first time when you hear it. You love it, but when you hear it in the second time, it doesn't share what the first impact did. But that said sound, and the story of Alex, trust me, we can go to the next generation. Now to the semi-future which almost takes in our world because it's 2021. But this is Black Ops 2 in 2025, having the weapon UI look different, the world being more in the war while Solsar said, so this is a 1% leaf. and having the old social media Twitter and YouTube really look old as we remember. But anyways, this is the present time, and I gave you the before time of the past with my huge appreciation for the characters and story. Black Ops 2 characters in the present are really different. There's two characters that you remember exist in the present, Woods himself and Mason, if you want to include the ending. Sectioner Alexan wants to stop Menendez but doesn't understand what he knows, so he questions his uncle, Woods, for pieces and solving the case by the solarium. His motivation and other things to do, like stopping the SDC forces from conquering, so while you're in Odysseus doing missions, you're also calling the shots when the side missions do happen, just so you can ally with the SDC forces when you kill its leader, General Zhao. And having the fleet of America and China combined, just to stop Menendez, your mission in the first is rather retrieve the solarium, and while you do, Eric, one of the scientists, said this. I heard talk of something called Karma. It may be the, the name for the cyber weapon. But it's not a weapon when you're in Colossus, but it's a girl. She's the key who can crack the solarium, that in fact you know since you tried to watch Menendez and its side antagonist, the Falco who is a person that has a psycho in his head that I will explain later to the side characters. Anyways, in Fallen Angel, one little detail I like to point out is how Menendez always outsmart you in every mission when you're close to him because of Salazar, the character that tries to sabotage you like knowing your position in Fallen Angel, tries to free Menendez while David is distracted, playing dead, and betrays you in a crucial moment. It's something that explains everything when you're having a lot of questions on how Menendez outsmarts you. And that brings me to the characters, and its side characters. David, Harper, Salazar, and Crossby are characters that is there for missions and its story. Crossby doesn't have a moment because of his screen time is really low, and I mean really low. Salazar is just a person that is just there for participation, and while that's true, he's the responsible on what I said, betraying you. Harper and David are also like Woods and Alex but more of a next generation of soldiers, which is fitting. The Falco is alright if you didn't have a chance to get him killed by Farid or in your hands. He's mostly there just for a sidekick that is a psychopath, which is great, but my issue to this character is just the pacing if you kill him. Because on paper, he's really great for making Menendez more crazier, making David wanting to stop Menendez in a great reason. Killing him really quick in Colossus will make you rescue Karma really quick, and doesn't make the mission second chance which that strike force is the weakest. Farid is the opposite of the Falco, whereas the Falco always targets Karma first and Odysseus, Farid is the protector of her and calling himself a double agent where he tries to talk about descriptions and contribution of capturing Menendez. Also they both have their own team. Briggs on the other hand is just there for comedy, one of your typical Battlefield 3 soldiers, but the character, instead of a generic soldier, it's just funny to hear his lines and its delivery. Cocksuckers looking for a new gig! Karma is just a person who's more of a scientist nerd. She's the reason for stopping the solarium. And last not the least, Menendez. Menendez in the past wants to avenge his sister, which he succeeded on. And in the present, he wants to make China and the US into another cold war while making his revenge. And wanna know why Menendez tries to capture himself? so he can upload the virus and use the American's fleet against them. And that's what I like about Menendez. And also, wanna know how Menendez made Cordus Dia? He used YouTube and Twitter just to rally people and being smart. And now to the choices. There are 8 endings where you can pick. 
and dialogues, make the cast more on the voice work and cutscenes. This is what represents Black Ops 2, and one of my highlights, like killing Harper will make Karma alive, and you're able to crack the solarium and have a good ending, or sacrificing Farid just to save Harper, so Harper can help you in the gameplay sections, or more dialogue from him. And this is a surprising moment because Treyarch had limited time to develop this and was able to make optional missions, choices fleshed out, and nothing that downgrades but improves on. There is one problem with the choices. While every choice is great and it can be really different, some choices are contrived or unrealistic. How does Harpy still survive when Farid gets himself killed? Well, sacrificing himself in an unrealistic way. Now I understand that people think I'm bashing the game, but that isn't my intention. Black Ops 2 is a great game, but when viewed it mostly, it became an eye roll when replaying it a lot and giving it credit without investigation. But despite the unrealisticness of its ending cutscenes, the story is rather simple and doesn't have a lot of subtleness like Alex's story did. It still has subtleness, like the reason why Alex doesn't show up until the ending because he knows Menendez is still alive. And when you kill or capture him and cracking the solarium at the same time, he shows up to Wood's house and making one of the moments to his son that makes him remember fondly with his car. But aside from all the negatives, this game didn't make me frustrated and actually enjoyed replaying it again in the 100th time. But this time, when analyzing its story and gameplay. But aside from all that pop and shooting, we now have to face the equals for ourselves. Returning to Call of Duty Multiplayer, having that experience points, rank up, prestigious, and loadouts. This game still has a player base even if its launch is so controversial and hated a lot. And what I mean by that is Vanguard. I haven't played Black Ops 2 for so long and it's really hard for me to get back after playing Battlefield 4, Counter Strike, and Halo Infinite. Playing Black Ops 2 is every Call of Duty game that you remember, but it's mostly about refining the tools rather than innovating. Modern Warfare was the start of the movement, shooting, killstreaks, and loadouts. While Black Ops 2 is rather refined, custom killstreaks, custom loadouts or mostly different loadouts, and different maps. So this is rather a Call of Duty multiplayer itself instead of Black Ops 2. The thing that's great about Call of Duty is how accessible it is and your enemies are easy to kill while you're easy to get killed. Call of Duty multiplayer matches are easy to play and quickest because it's still possible to kill a 1000 hour player while you're a 100 hour player. Because when you play other games like CSGO or Battle Royale games, it's how you need to learn its movement, utility, and guns. While the progress of that is interrupted by cheaters, toxic players, trollers, and smurfers. Just to achieve nothing but the in-game rank. Meanwhile, Call of Duty is easy to play while having some depth to it. While making the reason why people still want to play more just to get more stuff. And its perks are just a phrase. And you can understand it quickly even if you're a casual player. While it has the multiplayer gameplay being still as we remember, the reason why people still stick around are modes. Goofy modes, montages, or the hour no life prestigious. But there is a problem. And while problems are common for multiplayer games, we know when we play games such as Halo and he gets an energy sword, well that's a power weapon. And it's the reason why he can get it because he has the risk and feels reward at the same time. While it's only one dude, meanwhile Call of Duty or Battlefield are finding a way to get metaguns like the broken shotgun famous from Cold Warzone or the worst goddamn thing that Battlefield 4 players use, the infamous AEK where you have to deal 5 or more. And it's perks having to find a way to find a great perk just to use it. Which comes to my next problem, the loadouts. Call of Duty Modern Warfare or other Call of Duty games don't have a quick hand system. They make the player restricted using secondaries, primaries, perks, and utilities. It's just an easy way to add perks and attachments to your favorite or a meta gun. It's rather a restriction rather than being more in depth by making the players make sacrifices, which can work. Not using a pistol but full perks and a gun that has attachments with it can have some consequences. 
but at the same time limits the player. What brings to the Black Ops 2 on the table and why people love it is because instead of sacrificing or removing things, they try to refine while adding more stuff that people will replay in years. And maybe, people will tend to enjoy that kind of gameplay loop from Call of Duty, even if it's getting backlash every year when Call of Duty releases. So while I love its step in CSGO or trusting my teammates on a vehicle on Halo Infinite, sometimes I wanna be alone while at the same time enjoying its gameplay loop. And that gameplay loop was the reason why Zombies was viewed really well. World at War, a game that people remember fondly for its zombies, and Black Ops 1 extended by its maps and the arcade mode. And I love the arcade mode. What about Black Ops 2 then? Well, the community is a mixed bag for transit, so I'll talk about transit and some maps. I won't talk its DLC though, and Griff. So you can put your own thoughts in the comments if you want. Black Ops 2 Transit is something I remember as a kid. Hated it and haven't played zombies. So now, being more mature and understanding zombies now, on paper, it's really cool. Zombies spawn in the outside, making it more believable rather than spots we're used to for zombies. And to be fair, its open world is really cool. But the issue is what surrounds it. Lava is one of them. It's annoying to get damage if you jump still, and it's annoyance instead of dynamic gameplay. 2. Why can't we open map markers so at least we know where to go instead of guessing things? 3. Why are there zombie types that are just annoying and slow your progress for the wrong reasons? And 4. The bus. Not only it's random, but making zombies climb. If there's no zombies in the bus, that can be a breather, but I understand why. Because the players will stay there forever and ruin waves. So that's a nitpick. But everything is still here. Announcer, quite a bit different. The zombies, pack a punch, and mystery box. And when you don't like transit, you can just play two maps for free. And probably I prefer farmlands. Because it reminds me of World at War map, Knock Their Totan, sorry if I pronounce it wrong, because it's simplicity and bare bones. But that bare bones is simple to play, so that depends if you like that bare bones. The sad thing is, Black Ops 2 might be the least replayable for Treyarch due to lack of maps unless you got a DLC. There's even no arcade, which is odd, and minor little stuff. Overall, I still enjoy playing Black Ops 2 Zombies Transit. While great, has poor or decent execution, depending on your conclusion. To note, Transit isn't bad, but it's minor things stack things up, and that's my issue with Transit. But I wasn't frustrated since I can have a regular zombie experience from these two maps instead of forcing us to play this open world. In conclusion, Black Ops 2 Campaign is one of the best highlights for the COD series. While its multiplayer is alright, I respect Treyarch putting risk while adding some types like Gun Game from Black Ops 1. And Zombies is rather a mixed bag for me. It's really decent but I prefer every Treyarch Zombies rather than this. But I will probably top this to Sledgehammer Zombies. Exo Zombies I haven't experienced it so I cannot bring that up yet. I appreciate Treyarch and this is the last card that they bring a lot of effort. Treyarch has a reputation of making great campaigns before and when discussing Treyarch returning its roots, which is the story from Cold War, I respect them to this day when taking risk. Zombies might be a mixed bag and might be the weakest from Treyarch's library, and multiplayer for me is alright, and this is mostly my subjective opinion. And the reason why I said this is the last known effort is because when they launch other Call of Duty games, Black Ops 3 has content, but its campaign is a shame, but its multiplayer in Zombies is the strongest or the alright type. Black Ops 4 launched poorly but featuring battle royale that didn't last long or lack of content and zombies can be a mixed bag. Cold War has lack of content and a buggy launch due to limited time so I understand Cold War's struggles and the thing is Black Ops 2 and Black Ops 1 was developed in 2 years. Maybe the reason why recent Treyarch games launched poorly because people change and everything won't last long. Although, I still respect Treyarch and Infinity Ward because they can at least make a decent Call of Duty game or slightly worse, depends on your view. All we know is that view depends on the future.
This might be the longest video I have ever done. Thank you to everyone who watches and inspired me also. Whether you're a YouTuber, a curious viewer, friends, or an older viewer. Seeing 70 views on my first video made me motivated and at least changed for my expectations for the better. I hope I deliver something that I spent weeks writing, researching, and playing. And I don't want to make my ending note a bit long and want you to listen to the Black Ops 2 charm. Thank you, and have a very nice year.